in the dark shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read each and tones, the order order abracast. We are the brave and bold. Stigmata Studios presents The Jin Jihad The Jin Jihad kicks your face with myths, mysteries, epic battles, suicide bombers, quirky characters, and divine power armor. In this epic graphic novel, the warrior archangels descend on a city in chaos. It's all-out war. The non-standard assembly battles an ancient terrorist organization and their ultimate weapon, a corrupted, magically enhanced, unstoppable monster, the Jin. This graphic novel is a wild ride. It's one part distant Arab myth, one part Old Testament angelic vengeance, and one part unique heroic tough guys. Available on Amazon, Get more info on the Jin Jihad and other titles at StigmataStudios.com. We excommunicate and anath- anathematize <clears throat> every heresy that raises rises against the holy Orthodox and Catholic faith, faith which we ab- have above explained condemning all heretics under whatever names they may be known for while they have different faces they are nevertheless bound to each other by their tails since in all of them vanity is a common element those condemned <clears throat> being handed over to the secular rulers of their bailiffs let them be abandoned to be punished with due justice clerics being first degraded from their order as to the property of the condemned. If they are laymen, let it be confiscated. If clerics, let it be applied to the churches from which they received revenues. But those who are only suspected due consideration being given to the nature of their suspicion and to the character of the person, unless they prove their innocence by a proper defense, let them be anathematized and avoided by all until they have made suitable satisfaction. But if they have been under excommunication for one year, then let the let them be condemned as heretics secular authorities whatever office they may hold shall be admonished and induced <clears throat> induced and if a necessary compelled by ecclesiastical censor <clears throat> that as they wish to be esteemed and numbered among the faithful so for the defense of the faith they ought to publicly take an oath that they will strive in good faith to be the best of their abilities to exterminate in the territory subject to their jurisdiction all heretics pointed out by the church. All heretics pointed out by the church. So that whenever anyone shall have assumed authority, whether spiritual or temporal, let him be bound and confirm this decree by oath. But if a temporal ruler, after having been requested and admonished by the church, should neglect to cleanse his territory of this heretical foulness, let him be excommunicated by the Metropolitan and the other bishops of the province." If he refuse to make sanctions within a year, let the matter be known uh, to the Supreme Pontiff that uh, that he may declare the ruler's vassals absolved from their allegiances. And many offer the territory to be ruled lay Catholics who, on the excommunication of these 
or sorry, the extermination of these heretics may possess it without hindrance and preserve it with the purity of faith. The right, however, of the chief ruler is to be respected as long as he offers no obstacle in this manner and permits freedom of action. The same law to be observed regarded <clears throat> to those who have done no chief rule, who have no chief rulers. That is, uh, they are independent Catholics who have girded themselves with the cross for the extermination of the heretics shall enjoy the indulgences and privileges granted to those who go in defense of the Holy Land. We decree that those who give credence to the teachings of the heretics as well as those who receive, defend, and patronize them are excommunicated and will firmly declare that after any one of them have been branded with excommunication, if he has deliberately failed to make satisfaction within a year, let him incur ooh, ipso jure the stigma of infamy <laughs> and let him not be admitted to the public offices for deliberations and let him t not take part in the election of others to such offices to use his right to give testimony in court of law let him also be in intestable that he may not have free exercise of making a will and let him be deprived of the right of inheritance and let no one be urged to give account to him in any manner. Let him be urged to give account to others. If per chance he be a judge, let his decisions have no force and let any cause be brought to his attention. Uh, if, he be an advocate, let his assistance by no means be sought. If a notary, let the instruments drawn up by him be considered worthless. For the author being condemned, let them enjoy a similar fate. In all similar cases, we command that the same be observed. If, however, he be a cleric, let him be dis deposed from every office and benefice, and the greater the fault, the graver may be the punishment inflicted. <clears throat> if any ruse to avoid such after they have been ostracized by the church, let them be excommunicated till they have made suitable satisfaction. Clerks or sorry, clerics shall not give the sacraments of the church uh, to such pestilential people, nor shall they presume to give them Christian burial or to receive their alms or offerings. Otherwise, they shall be deprived of their office. <clears throat> to which they may not be restored without a special indult of the apost apostolic see. Similarly, the regulars on whom also this punishment may, may be imposed, let their privileges be nullified in that dio diocese in which they have presumed to perpetrate such excess. But since some under the appearance of godliness but denying the power thereof <clears throat> as the apostles say arrogate themselves the authority to preach as the same apostle says quote how shall they preach unless they be sent romans ten fifteen? <clears throat> all the prohibited uh or not sent who without the authority of the apostle apostolic see apostolic see why is i'm having a hard time getting or <clears throat> of the the catholic bishop of the locality shall presume to usurp the office of preaching either publicly or privately shall be excommunicated and unless they amend and the sooner the better they shall be visited with a further suitable penalty we add moreover that every archbishop or bishop shall himself or <clears throat> through his archdeacon or some other suitable persons twice at least 
uh, at least once a year, make the rounds of his diocese in which report has it that heretics dwell. And there uh, compel three or more men of good character, or if it should be deemed advisable, the entire neighborhood to swear that if anyone know of the presence there of heretics, or others holding secret assemblies <laughs> or differing from the common way of the faithful and the faith and morals, they will make them known to the bishop. The later, <clears throat> the latter shall then call together before those accused who, if they do not purge themselves of the matter of which they are accused, or if the or if after the rejection of the error they lapse into some former wickedness, they shall canonically, they shall be canonically pu punished. But if any of them by damnable abstence should uh, disapprove of the oath, they should perchance be unwilling to swear from this very fact that let them be regarded as heretics. We wish, therefore... That in virtue of obedience, strict command that uh, to carry out these instructions effectively, these bishops exercise throughout their diocese uh, a scrupulous vigilance. Uh, uh, if they wish to escape canonical punishment, um, if from sufficient evidence it is, a, it is apparent that a bishop is negligent or remiss in cleansing his diocese of the the ferment of heretical wickedness, <laughs> let him be deposed from the Episcopal office and let another who will and can confound heretical depravity be substituted. This is from the document that... <clears throat> this is from the document that launched the Inquisition. It's uh, the first... It's the third canon from the Laterian, the fourth Laterian, uh, conference. Wow. I feel like the episode's already half over. The Abercast, Occult, History, Conspiracy, Violence. <clears throat> All right, hey, I'm John uh, Towers. This is The Abercast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, last episode, we talked about sort of the... What happened directly before the church launched the inquisition and that was this uh, crusade this 20 year long crusade against the gnostic cathars in southern france it's called the albergensian crusade so this is really just leading right out of that so if you guys haven't listened to that episode it might be a good place to start Basically, in a nutshell, if you don't want to go back and listen to it, to summarize, uh, Pope Innocent III went crazy. He went batshit. <laughs> and uh, he launched the first crusade on European soil against these uh, these French Gnostics that lived in the Languedoc section of southern France in a 20-year war just slaughtering these mud hippies, <laughs> these like new AIDS, uh, Christians. And I pause it. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I believe that probably, I mean, 
they took it as a slight against Catholicism for sure, but I think the main problem was the money issue. They weren't paying tithings. <clears throat> They weren't paying tithings to the Catholic Church, and they didn't ask for or accept tithings from the royalty that they were kind of living with. <clears throat> so, and like then their their cardinals and stuff would come down to uh, the Languedoc and get converted to Gnosticism. <laughs> it was like Pope Innocent was like, "That is it. I've had enough." Get your swords. You guys are all going to get indulgences. And we talked about Simon or Simone de Montfort, the guy who rounded up a bunch of prisoners and cut their fucking noses and lips and ears off. <laughs> it's a fucking monster. So I should have said this last episode because I did bash the Catholic Church a little bit. But so I'll just say it this episode um, that uh, I would like to acknowledge the good things the Catholic Church did do in these dark ages. You know, <clears throat> um, I it's funny because I always say whenever I talk about the Battle of Tours, but I but I realize I've never done an episode on it. So <laughs> so maybe I should stop saying that <clears throat> or maybe I should just do an episode on it. Anyhow, you know, I believe that without guys like uh, uh, Charles Chuck the Hammer Martell um, and his uh, the professional soldiers that he had, or you know the Polish King Jan Sobieski the Third, or um, you know any number of these uh, any number of these people that worked in conjunction with the church to beat back the Muslim expansionism in those days. Like, I mean, it's, um, I believe, and I should write like a, one of those alternate history things. And like everyone in the whole world is just suffering, living under this Islamic caliphate because the Catholic church collapsed and nothing was there to keep the Muslims in check. Uh, when the, when they were trying to conquer Europe, <clears throat> uh, that's a that's a, a thing for me. Like that's a that's an idea. So there it is. That's an idea for you. <laughs> Anyone who's ever wanted to write anything, there you go. There's that's free for you. <clears throat> but I was on a podcast years ago doing. Um, I was talking about Christmas myths and like Saturnalia or whatever. And for some reason, I. Uh, the way the questions in the interview was going, it turned me into like this Catholic, like I was an apologist for the Catholics. And, you know, that's not true either. I'm just, I'm happy to say that I know I can identify the good things that they did. Um, is it outweighed by the bad things that they've done? I don't know. I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm glad that I'm not sitting here fucking speaking Farsi, having to pray five times a day or get my fucking head cut off. I'm pretty happy about that for sure. For sure. So, um, okay. With that being said, uh, we're going to get into this, uh, inquisition. I want to also point out real quick that there's, uh, there's been a few inquisitions. It seems like they were broken up by geography, but we're going to be talking about the medieval inquisition specifically. So, um, so that's put that. So if you're expecting me to do a lot of no one expected the Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> da -da -da! Um, that's going to be another episode. So uh, probably no other Monty Python references here. Um, let's see. Do do do. Oh, uh, <clears throat> the Patreon is still out there. It's moving a little slowly, <laughs> so without bashing everyone over the head with it, I just want to say, like, the first goal is actually about launching a Books for Soldiers program. I'm already tied into two organizations that do it. I just need a little bit of help um, with shipping and P.O. boxes and stuff, because I don't want everyone to be sending books to my fucking house. So <clears throat> um, if you're interested in that, if that sounds good at all, please consider supporting on Patreon. And plus you get a bunch of great stuff. So there's already a tons of, um, exclusive audio on there. With that being said, please, uh, 
consider supporting the show in other ways, like rating and reviewing on iTunes. Um, that's always good because uh, it helps put the eyes on the show. So I haven't had a rate and a review in a while. So come on, I'm looking right at you. You think he's like, if you're sitting there and you're like, is he talking about me? Then yes, I am talking about you. <laughs> All right, so this evening I want you to grab your jar. Um, you know, if you subscribe on Patreon, I'm getting some uh, Abercast the Oath mason jars made up. So if you're interested in that, you might want to. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Oh, I want you to mix up your gin jihad, charge it up. Because we're taking off. <laughs> we're taking off on this long and lonely, depressing story of the medieval Inquisition. <clears throat> so, uh, to, I guess just to get started, actually on the topic, um, I guess I'm one of these guys where I wa- my wife is addicted to, not reality TV, but she's addicted, uh, addicted to true crime shows so it's like she's always watching snapped that's why i'm like if she ever offers me a cup of blue kool-aid i'm never gonna take it (laughs) but um i'm all i'm the guy like that watches you know the shield and i'm like yeah vic Mackey beat the shit out of that guy and get him to talk or like 24 and uh when i was doing research for this episode i actually stumbled across this website it's the uh, the Constitutional Rights Foundation website, and they actually have a piece on here about the Inquisition. So I'm going to just kind of start with this. <clears throat> um, again, this is from the Constitutional Rights Foundation website. It says, uh, many people complain that courts turn too many criminals loose because of technicalities. For example, the police search a house without a warrant, or the police get a confession without explaining the right of silence. And as a result, someone who might uh, uh, might be a burglar or a murderer goes free. Um, this may seem unjust, but each of those, quote, technicalities, unquote, has been developed as, per- as a protection for everybody. <sighs> One of the best ways to see this is to look at a world where these uh, protections didn't exist. In the Middle Ages in Europe, investigators brutally hunted down people they thought might be witches and heretics and those who oppose an established religion. People were secretly accused and had no protections at all. Many thousands of people were imprisoned or even burned alive. These events left a scar on Western European history that affects us even to this day. And maybe provided uh, it may provide lessons for her own time, and I thought that that was poignant because <clears throat> a lot of people on you know whatever social media that you're on, a lot of folks are running around pretending to be <laughs> constitutional scholars. You know, um, I saw this Facebook, but look, like, look. So I'm in a pretty liberal. Uh, continuum you know uh i know a lot of artists and i know a lot of writers and i know a lot of you know lgbtq um burlesque performers and and this kind of stuff so uh i'm constantly inundated with the stupidest fucking facebook memes and whatever not that those people are stupid they just are posting stupid things (laughs) like i saw this thing that was like uh, I can't remember what country it was. It was like Norway or S- Sweden or something. And it was like, we are the happiest people around because we have free college. Uh, we have uh, low, we have low gun crime because uh, we have very strict gun rules. We have mandatory five weeks of uh vacation time we have this and that and the other thing and we're the freest country ever and i'm (laughs) and i'm just like oh it doesn't mention the crippling taxes and it doesn't 
the people that read it and then are clicking the like button are not even being like, oh, they have so low gun crime because they have such strict gun laws and they're just so free, you know, like it just falls apart at the weight of it. So um, I thought that it was kind of interesting to look at this story under the um, under the the grid of or the structure of rights or more appropriately the lack of rights that these people had <laughs> i read the uh the third canon in the latirian the fourth latirian council and it's it's terrifying it's terrifying that the people in power can just meet and they all have this group think anyone that's ever worked in an office knows about group think. And it's just bullshit. It's just like the boss going, this is what I think. And everyone else going, yep, 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 yep. You're right. That's what I think too. We're group think. We, we share our thoughts. We share thinking. And you're just like, uh, oh, that's terrifying. Like, don't be a joiner. That goes for everybody. <clears throat> so where am I at? Well, I'm just rambling. <laughs> Okay, uh, 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 Okay. the summary of the events leading up to the launch of the Inquisition in 1209 to 1229, the Catholics uh, participated in a crusade against fellow Christians uh, who were Gnostics in the Albergensian slash Cathar crusade in southern France, a long, bloody, disgusting, brutal war against religious New Age type of mud hippies of the <laughs> medieval age. This drove Cathars who survived um, and they who they if they remained alive <clears throat> and unburned. Uh, to go underground and become a type of crypto Gnostic uh, church leaders felt something had to be done, something very strong. So they sat down and they drew up these procedures. <clears throat> so at the fourth Laternian council in uh, Rome, Pope Innocent the third gathers the world's Latin Christian leaders together in 1215. <clears throat> He announced uh, this new these new rules of prosecution against heretics and wayward clergy. Uh, the system or the process gives an inquisitor the power to secretly build a case against an individual based only on the opinions of the people within the community. So that's important. He's not building a case on evidence. He's building a case on people's opinions of you. Gee. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure the people in my neighborhood would be like, yeah, burn that motherfucker right now. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to just grab, um, Sean Martin's book here, the Cathars, uh, the most successful heresy in the middle ages. This is one of the feature books from last episode, but he's the end of his book here talks a lot about the goes, talks a lot about the inquisition. Uh, and I just want to go, I just want to get in here, um, uh, in this section called the Inquisition after Montsegur. Remember Montsegur is where, uh, all the, the, not the surviving Gnostic, uh, uh, perfects held up in this giant castle in Montsegur and all of them refused to recant and they were all burned. They were all burned alive. <clears throat> Uh, with the last major uh, redoubt of the Cathars gone, perfect and believers found themselves in a world where little shelter and fewer protectors. No one was safe. As P Peter Garcia found out to his cost in Toulouse during Lent in 1247, his relative William, a French Francis, I was about to say a Francescan. <laughs> Oh, what are you doing? You know he's a Gnostic. Uh, uh, William, a Franciscan, had invited him uh, to their convent in order to discuss issues of faith and doctrine. Naturally, Peter had no qualms about telling William about his Cathar faith. After all, William was family. 
Peter railed against the Church of Rome, declaring that it was a harlot uh, who gives poison, while the laws of Moses was nothing but shadow and vanity. Peter was too trusting in a scene reminiscent of the exposing of Basil, the physician. I don't know that story. Uh, The curtain was pulled back to reveal that Peter's testimony had been carefully transcribed by a team of secretaries. (laughs) Oh man, that fucking sucks. Peter was handed over to the inquisition. This reminds me of in return of the Jedi where Leia is dressed up as the bounty hunter and she frees hand and they have their little moment, and then you just hear, whoa, oh, 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 and the curtain opens up, and Jabba's whole fucking court was is watching her spring the trap. William Garcia was not the only person to betray his family to the Inquisition. A former Cathar perfect Sickard of Luanel denounces scores of his former associates and supporters, whether they had offered him a bed for the night or given him a jar of honey. The list of people he denounced included his fucking parents. Sicker's treachery was amply rewarded by the church, and he survived well into old age. These two examples were when we talk. We're going to be talking about specific inquisitors in a little bit, and one of them was actually a converted Cathar. He was a Cathar that converted to Catholicism, and then they're like, "Yo, bro, go." <laughs> Go get your people. <laughs> the Languedoc in the years immediately after the fall of Montsegur was subject to an inquestoral scrutiny of proto Stalinist proportions. <laughs> That's another thing you see when you're researching the Inquisition. People always liken it to um, uh, uh, the Red Scare in the in the fifties. <clears throat> You know, but in that case, history is sort of bored out that <laughs> I shouldn't say this. All right. I'm going to say it. History is sort of borne out that uh, uh, McCarthy was right. <laughs> I mean, look at the news. Look at your education system. Fucking they're everywhere. Where am I at? Two examples were but among many. The Languedoc in the years immediately after the fall of Montsegur was subject to inquestoral scrutiny of proto-Stalinist proportions. Heading this clamp down on the 13th century equivalent of thought crime were Bernard of Cow and uh, John of St. Peter. Over 5,000 depositions survive. Uh, But this is only a fraction of what was actually taken down at the time. So we'll see what they're talking about um, is all these inquisitors had notaries and scribes with them so they could write down exactly what they're exactly what these people who were accused said. And even when they move past the the um, kind of the court phase and we move into sort of like the interrogation phase like the okay i'll just stop mincing words when they move into the torture phase of this whole thing these torture rooms were filled with scribes as well <clears throat> were i mean maybe not filled but there were scribes in there and they wrote down everything these people were that were being tortured they wrote down everything they said so when the torture stopped and they're recuperating you go back and they could be like well this is what you fucking said is that what you fucking meant I forgot. I lost my fucking space again. Malcolm Lambert, probably Malcolm Lambert, uh, notes Bernard and John and their brethren were attempting to build a total all embracing picture of Cathar belief practices and support in the areas in which they operated for the Cathars being caught presented a major dilemma. The perfect were forbidden were forbidden to to lie or to swear oaths. Uh, whatever they did, they were would be uncompromising to their beliefs. Some chose to tell the truth and thereby implicate other perfect. Believers and supporters, while others either lied or gave away as little information as possible, others opted for collaboration and became double agents. 
uh, continuing their lives as Cathar believers and receiving the fugitive perfect into their home and then reporting on them. Collaboration, however, was risky as there were frequent uh, reprisals against turncoats, which such was Ar- Arnold uh, P- Pradier, who had uh, been a perfect during the de Montfort years, um, and later converted to Cath- uh, Catholic Catholicism, along with his wife, who had also been a perfect, and began naming names. The Inquisition installed them in the safe house in the Chateau Nuboranus in Toulouse. Uh, where they lived well at the church's expense. <clears throat> Although resistance continued, the castle bond, the Inquisitor, was uh, poisoned, and the castle attacked. There was ultimately little uh, people could do. The Inquisition became a fact of life, uh, an entrenched institution rather than a single unrepealed ordeal. If people were suspected of giving false or incomplete testimony, they were hauled back in front of the Inquisitors to be re-interrogated, regardless of whether they were highborn or peasant. Faced with such intensive action, most notably, uh, most nobility realized there was no point anymore in trying to oppose the church. Even Raymond uh, the Seventh began to persecute suspected heretics, burning eighty at a. AGN in June of 1249. All right, so that put, uh, that kind of put a, a personal view of the Inquisition. Let's see what the Catholic Dictionary has to say. <clears throat> An ecclesiastical tribunal, the Inquisition. Now, there's a couple different, there's the canonical, the Roman the Spanish Inquisition, because no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, but this is just the, the first thing here. Hold on. An ecclesiastical tribunal for the discovery, punishment, and prevention of heresy, first instituted in the su- in southern France by Pope Gregory the Ninth in t- 1229, Hitherto, heresy has been uh, dealt with by secular power at the insistence of bishops, uh, but the spread of Catharism provoked uh, this new procedure. The Inquisition was generally administered by the Dominicans. We're going to get into that later. (laughs) But was not founded or even formulated by St. Dominic. The institution was based on the principle that truth has rights whose demands must be upheld and promoted when the interests of secular uh, in the interests of secular, no less than ecclesiastical justice. So this is laughable on its face just already. Error has no rights. <clears throat> And must be abandoned or uprooted. The Inquisition was a, uh, I don't know what this word is, punct- punctilious <laughs> in its adherence to law. Uh, but after full allowance has been made for other times, other manners, uh, quote, other times, other manners, unquote, some of its procedures and punishments must be set down as utterly unreasonable. And in consequence, cruel. In France, it became a semi-political tribunal, which uh, disappeared in the 16th century. It was never established in England or the Germanies. It might not have been established in the Germanies, but there were definitely inquisitions in in, uh, Germany. Uh, We're actually going to talk about the one of the inquisition inquisitors that got sent to to specifically to Germany for Rome and Spain. See below. All right. So uh, the can canonical inquisition the definition of this is the secret judicial investigation to be made before anyone is summoned to appear in the ecclesiastical court in criminal action the inquisitor is usually one of the synodal examiners he must make his report uh, to the ordinary and he may not act as judge in the trial of the cause so this what they're talking about 
or is these inquisitors, the clergymen that are acting on behalf of the inquisition <clears throat> were not allowed to put people to death. They weren't allowed to make people bleed even. Um, so just like any law or procedure that you don't want to follow, you have to figure out loopholes to get through it. Um, and a lot of the, when we're talking and a lot of this is like, oh, well, you have to see the secular authorities. The reason that they say the secular authorities is that the church could keep their hands unbloodied you know the church they're doing all these investigations and then they're like okay arrest the fucking guy <clears throat> interrogate him they're using you know the secular authorities torture people you know like these dominicans aren't in there you know, <laughs> lifting up people on the strapado like they're, they're not doing that you know, and then when they make their judgment, they just, they go, okay, well, sheriff or whatever, uh, now it's on you, you know, and they shed a crocodile tear and they're like, you know, we hope that you go real easy on this heretical piece of shit. <laughs> and the guy's like, what does that mean? Do you want me to burn him alive or not? I mean, uh, wink or something like, so I know what's going on. <laughs> so 1231 a new pope uh gregory which we already talked about appoints the first in inquisitors of heretical depravity um uh the first inquisitors are unleashed in the french and Ger german countryside and f <clears throat> for the heretics who do not recant they will be burned at the stake so let's talk about some of these early uh, inquisitors. Uh, we have a noble, a nobleman and a clergyman named Conrad of Marburg. And he gets sent directly to Germany. He was like, yo, go police up your people because you're from Germany. <clears throat> and this guy, he goes into Germany and he reports. <laughs> he So he goes into Germany looking for scattered Albergensians. He goes there looking for Cathars. And what he reports instead is he discovers a whole coven of Luciferians. And at 1233, Conrad accuses Henry II, who's the Count of Sayin, he's just Sayin, for uh, taking part in satanic orgies. Um, this guy is like off the rails and like these German nobility, these German noblemen are like, yo, you better check this guy because he's crazy. Eventually, he was slain by several knights on the road, on the road home, <laughs> and these knights probably worked for this Henry the Second character. But he just goes and he just makes up this thing. He's like, you know, you sent me here looking for Gnostics, but I found worse. I found Luciferians, and they're all kissing goats' asses and having wild orgies. Conrad of Marburg. It's just another one of these monsters that they, that they get. Uh, let's, get, let's I'm just going to take a quick break here. Okay, um, this, uh, the other, one of these early inquisitors, not the other, it's not like there's only two of them, but the two that we're talking about, uh, he's an inquisitor in northern France, and he was actually a Cathar convert. This is the dude that was a convert. His name was Robert. He rounded up 183 Cathars and torched them alive, all in one day. <laughs> here's another one of these monsters this guy's like oh well i converted i really gotta show them you know that i'm on their side burning 183 people alive in one day is 
I mean, it's I don't I can't even wrap my head around it. I mean, you would need a lot of coleslaw and barbecue sauce. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> it's a Catholic joke because they're cannibals. The Pope eventually imprisons this guy. So eventually Gregory the Ninth gets tired of all these chump inquisitors and turns to the Dominicans for help. And when I read that, I was like, all right, why, why the Dominicans? Why are, why did these guys get tapped to be these inquisitors? And like, they're still paying for this. Like they still have a, they have, they're besmirched. So I found the answer. There's an article written by Dan Graves on Christianity.com. <laughs> and it's called Dominicans Became Dreaded Inquisitors. <clears throat> so we're going to get into this article right now. Two of the darkest blots on Christian history are the witch hunts of medieval Europe and the Inquisition. And the former employed the apparatus of the latter. No one knows for sure how many people suffered at the hands of the Inquisition. Thousands did. To most churchmen, the governments, it seems self-evident that orthodoxy must be preserved, whatever the price. Although Alexander Thir- Alexander the Third, Lucius the Third, and Innocent the Third, I'm rolling all threes here. Each made moves towards the Inquisition. It was Gregory the Ninth who instituted the machinery. In 1227, in that year, he appointed a board of inquisitors to sit against heresy in Florence. Shortly afterwards, he expanded the operation. And this was inevitable, given the author authoritarian nature of the medieval church and the ferment of the time. Heresy was rife in Italy, France, and the Balkans. By 1231, Gregory had issued former rules. As he envisioned the Inquisition, it would be for the salvation, coercion, and punishment of erring Catholics only. Jews, Muslims, and other non-Christians were not to be touched. Well, we see already that this is a lie. I don't know if this guy's full of shit, but whatever. (laughs) Other, quote, non-Christians, unquote, were the whole reason for this thing. The the Gnostics. Well, I guess they were Christians. All right, whatever. Were not to be touched. The Inquisition would inquire to the spread of heresy, summon suspected heretics before tribunals, and punish infidelity. So as to convert and save souls, it was aimed primarily at the growing number of Waldenians and Albergensians. Torture would be allowed, as it had been under Roman law. As his Inquisition... Inquisitor in France, Gregory appointed the brutal Robert Laborg, former heretic. Oh, I think that this is that Robert guy that we were just talking about. Yeah, he once had 180 individuals burned at the stake in one day. Yeah, this is the same dude. I found Robert, but he calls him Robert. Maybe it's just a weird French pronunciation thing. Robert Laborg. He performed so many other atrocities that he was finally recalled and imprisoned. He was like a fucking, he was like a gremlin. (laughs) They get recalled because when you rear end them, they explode. (laughs) It's a Catholic joke because they rear end. On the, (laughs) on this date, April 20th, 2033, by Papal Bull, Gregory placed the operation of the Inquisition into the hands of the Dominicans. The Dominicans were the obvious choice for the role, recognized by the church in 1220. The order's mission was to teach and preach, uh, to employ the power of reason in support of faith. (laughs) That sentence is hilarious. To employ the power of reason in support of faith. How do you employ the power of reason when you're trying to explain Christianity? A woman and a man ate an apple and it fucked everything up. And then God had to become his son and get sent to earth 
and get crucified to make up for it? What's the reason in that? <laughs> Catholic apologist, white knuckled, yelling at their iPads, <laughs> their phones. Oh, God, here we go. It is no coincidence that scholars like Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquintus, saintly and learned, were Dominicans. Dominic had made a point of winning heretics by the force of his holy life and persuasive preaching. The methods employed by his order were not so gentle. They included torture and execution, usually by burning Although the instructions for uh, interrogations limited the use of torture, the tendency was to exceed them. Many Dominicans never uh, participated in the Inquisition. Others were mild in their measures. Can I see a list of names? I want to see some names. I want to see some footnotes here on this wildly, uh, this wild accusation. Some resigned rather than to continue the brutal work again. Footnotes, please. Other, nonetheless, the good name of the Dominicans was forever stained by their per- participation in this cruel activity. Before long, the order became popularly known as Dom. <laughs> this is awesome. Before long, the order became popularly known as Domini Canis, Latin for God's dogs. Wow. I love it. Love it. Watch out, boy. I'll sick the dogs of God on you. All right, so Gregory the Ninth releases dozens of Dominican inqu- inquisitors into the countryside. And he announces his bishops that they are coming and that all the clergy needs to help them with their investigations because they were the inside guys in these communities. They were the boots on the ground. They were the eyes and the ears of these little villages and hamlets. So let's get into the different phases of, of a specific inquisition. So, you know, you get a raven on uh, the raven has a note on it that says, Hey, <laughs> Hey, uh, we're sending an inquisitor your way. You need to help this guy out any way possible. Uh, point out some, um, questionable people in your little town, people that might be holding secret meetings, people that asked questions, a little too many questions in Sunday school, uh, point them out to him and then support them with whatever he needs. And so this guy shows up, the Inquisitor shows up, and the first thing he does is he does this huge, like, two or three hour long sermon on uh, heresy, and he's like, you know, heresies are bad because, you know, they're different than what we, this is like when, (laughs) when I start railing about the Beatles, And I'm like, what's a big fucking deal about the Beatles? And people go nuts. People go fucking crazy. And they're like, if you don't know what the big deal is about the Beatles, you're just an idiot. You're an idiot. That's what these guys are. They're like, people that don't like the Beatles are idiots because they don't like the Beatles like we like the Beatles. So you got to like the Beatles exactly like we like the Beatles or you're all your heretics. People that don't like the Beatles the exact same way that I like the Beatles are heretics. Um, so the, when that ends, a period of grace happens. And when that, when the period of grace lasts a couple weeks and what it's not, it's not really a period of grace. What it's like, it's giving the guy time to get information on people. So if you're like, you know, I really, man, I remember, I remember at Felicia's birthday party, they were playing the Beatles. And I mentioned that I really did not like the Beatles. So someone might tell this guy that I don't like the Beatles. I better confess. So during this period of grace, the guy goes to the inquisitor and he was like, you know, I mentioned one time that I didn't like the Beatles, but it was really just the one song like come together. I don't like that song, but the Beatles are fine and they would be guaranteed some form of leniency if they were to, if they, you know, then the guy's like, all right, you don't like the Beatles say, you know, 400 Hey Jude's you know, go over here, help out at the soup kitchen, whatever. 
<laughs> uh, when the grace period is over, though, the faith period begins. And uh, it's the te- like the test of faith. And any accused person is subject to arrest and interrogation. So I'm just going to jump real quick back to this um, this article that I found at the Constitutional Rights Foundation website, the Inquisition looking into the human soul. Uh, they they break out they break down how this thing goes without the clumsy beetle allegory. <laughs> when the Inquisition came to the suspected area. The local bishop assembled the people to hear the inquisition, the inquisitor preach against heresy, and he would announce a grace period of up to a month for heretics to confess their guilt, recant, and inform on others. During this period, the inquisition would collect accusations. Uh, if two witnesses under oath accuse someone of heresy, the person uh, would be summoned to appear. Opinions, prejudices, rumors, and gossip were all accepted as evidence. The accused were never told the names of the accusers or even the exact charge. uh, Inquisitors examined the accused in secret. Anyone who refused to confess immediately was assumed to be guilty. Inquisitors were trained only in religion, but they would try to trap the accused with religious questions. For example, the inquisitors might ask, do you believe what the Holy Church believes? I am a faithful Christian, the fearful subject might reply. So the inquisitor might shout, we already know that you believe in heresies. You're saying your beliefs are the true Christianity and the church is false. No lawyers were allowed because it was considered heresy to defend a heretic. Wrap your mind around that. That reminds me of uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, where the <laughs> the quote Samoan unquote lawyer was like, even a werewolf, even a goddamn werewolf is entitled to a defense. The only possible escape was to recant as quickly as possible and name the names of heretics. Government authorities worked closely with the Inquisition and they would deliver the accused to the Inquisitors and when asked, they would torture those who refused to recant. Let's see, do I have anything here about tortures? Okay, the accused person is subject to arrest, blah, 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 I already did all this, summoned, no idea, accused, forced to name names, prison sentences, the seizures and confiscations of all your property, and then to get you to confess, torture. So in my notes, what I have here is the rack which we know is when they tie the extremities to this gear-like uh, device and they crank it, separating all your bo- all your bones and your joints, and uh, stretching that cartilage out. And as a former professional wrestler, I don't mind telling you that joint pain is the worst pain. <laughs> <laughs> then there's the strapado where that's where they tie your hands behind your back and then they tie a rope to your hands and they lift you up in the they create a pulley and they lift you up in the air by your hands you know the pressure on your shoulders must be amazing and <clears throat> i guess it depends on how big of a dude you are or whatever but they lift you up like that um, uh, with your hand by your hands with them tied behind your back. And then they will jerk the rope or let it fall a little bit and catch it. That's got to fucking suck. Then there's the wheel. And then the they have they also mention you find references to leg screws and shin vices, which sound awful. I mean, they just sound just shitty so the only defense you have if you're being tortured by these fucks is they can't like they can't cause blood flow so it's like they're not gonna pierce you or flay you alive which would also suck 
Um, it's all like t- t- twisting, <clears throat> twisting, pulling, you know, which, you know, it sounds like, I mean, <laughs> a fun Saturday night, but when you're, you know, and you have to just think also about people, the people that are doing this, like, what is their like sexual proclivity? You know, if you told me to stretch a guy out on the rack, I would be like, fuck, man, what? You know, <laughs> you get any kind of zeal or zest out of me like that. That's weird. Like, there's something weird going on, I think, with that. Right. And then like the shin vices and the leg screws and stuff like you're just like, I don't know. It's just, it sounds awful. And it sounds like a hotbed for perver- for perversion, you know. And the Catholic Church, I mean, they have a modern track record for, you know, weird per- perversions. Anyways. Okay, so uh, one more thing before I get back to this article is the, um, okay, so there was like a rules with this. So first of all, if you're going to be torturing somebody, you know, you got to like, sh- so we're just say like, we're going to put them on the rack, <clears throat> you know, Lex Luger is standing there and you're going to go on the rack. And uh, so first of all, you have to show them the rack. You have to be like, yo, this is where you're headed. And then you got to be like, what we're going to do is we're going to tie your feet here and we're going to tie your arms up there. And then Lex Luger is going to crank this handle and it's going to separate all the joints in your spinal column. It's going to pull them all apart and it's going to turn it. You're going to look like Stretch Armstrong when we're done. So it's like you got to show them the implement. You have to explain what the implement does. And then basically they're like, well, he's giving us permission to put him in that thing. And then it, and then it starts, you know, and it, and it, it's it, that also, now that I explain it like that, that reminds me of zero dark 30 where they got like the only, <laughs> the only male CIA guy that's not a cook is like the dude that puts the dog collar on the prisoner in the beginning. And he's like, you see that box, bro? That box sucks. And you're going in there. <laughs> he fucking puts the guy in the box. All right. Um, God, I, should I laugh at that? I don't know. I don't know if I should, but yeah, I, I always have thought that that was funny. All right. Uh, going back to the article, Gover- government authorities work closely with the Inquisition. They would deliver the accused uh, to the inquisitors and when asked they would torture those who refused to recant during torture the religious inquisitors would stand by as witnesses to record confessions now i've seen in other places where they were like they were not in there but they would send their notaries and their scribes in there to take down the names of other heretics the government also carried out the final sentence of imprisonment or death <laughs> So then you would move into uh, Sermo Generalis, which was the judgment phase. This is when you would figure out what's going to happen to you. Did you recant on time? Did you recant properly? You have to remember that these people didn't even know what they were accused of. Like, they were just like, yo, we talked to your neighbor. They didn't even get that. They didn't even get that. So it's like if they called you and they're like, we heard that you didn't like the Beatles. You didn't even get that. They just called you and like, what do you have to confess? Nothing. What do you mean? Nothing. I don't have anything to confess. And the guy's looking at at the paper in front of him. And he's like, well, his neighbor says he doesn't like the Beatles. His neighbor says that he threw rocks at him when he was singing Hey Jude out loud. His neighbor said that he didn't even like, I want to hold your hand. His other neighbor was like, fuck the yellow submarine. He quoted him saying, fuck the yellow submarine. Like this guy, I mean, he's going down. So the accused has no idea what, what these people had, had even said. They don't, he, they don't even get the chance to face their accuser in the courtroom or in the inquisition room or whatever. 
Those who were candid immediately. Oh, hold on, wait. So um, here are some. I'll read this one first, just in case it covers it. Back to the article. Those who were canon immediately might receive a fairly light sentence, saying prayers, fasting, being whipped in public, or making a pilgrimage. Uh, some who were canon were forced to wear a yellow cross of felt sewn on their clothing. Yeah. I have that distinctive clothing. They have to wear the yellow cross. And this, this carries over to at least the Spanish inquisition. Cause no one expected that. <laughs> uh, and many people uh, would stay away from them in fear. Many who refused to recant right away were sentenced to prison for life. If they refused to recant at all, the Inquisition turned them over to the government authorities to be burned alive. Some Inquisitors were so th thorough that they went after the dead. And if a dead person was accused of heresy, his or her bones would be dug up and burned. Imagine the wasted calories it was in these Middle Ages to dig up dead people just to burn their fucking bones for this imaginary, invisible man that lives in the sky this shit is crazy for most accused heretics there was no appeal a few rich or powerful people might beg the pope to change a sentence but for the most the condemned the sentence was final the families of those sent to prison or to the stake lost their property and that's another big thing like even today the catholic church owns probably the most property in the whole world I don't have any numbers to back that up, but I'm looking around <laughs> Pittsburgh and I'm like, there's a lot of fucking Catholic churches around here. Um, and I'm wondering how big of a reason that this was that the church could, uh, just like I mentioned the shield earlier, Vic Mackey in like one of the later episodes with Glenn Close was the new chief of police and she instituted the seizure policy where if you were arrested with drugs, we could take your car, we could take your fucking house. Like that's what this shit was. And it all comes full circle. <laughs> all right. Some of the other, um, in the sermo generalis, the, the ju judgment phase, some of the other, um, things that you could get, for punishment, you can get a time as a s slave. You can be sent on crusade. I think when the article sent, when the article that I just read the part of said you get sent on pilgrimage, I think that's a nice way of saying you get to go to the crusades. Uh, the distinctive clothing, and then if you uh, if you survived all of this, and then they re investigate you like if you went if you took back your heretical points of view after you survived the ordeal of the inquisition you could get burned at the stake um and they uh i i read this or i saw this thing where it was like well i know it, it would take hours to get consumed by flame most people that get burned alive wind up dying from smoke inhalation instead of getting burnt burned to death but even that takes a little bit longer than you would want. <laughs> Even if it's like, oh, uh, he was only burning alive for 10 minutes. Like 10, 10 minutes is a long time, bro. Last year, I accidentally spilt baking grease on my hand. And I had third degree burns all over my arm. If you go to my Instagram page, you can see burn watch 2017 or whatever I called it. And like, I was, I was burned and <laughs> the whole time, like I'm standing there and I, I, it's just sizzling on my, on my arm. And my wife was next to me. We were making breakfast for dinner and, uh, she's sitting next to me. She's jumping up and down. She's like, what, <laughs> what do you, what do you, what do you do? And I was just like, can you just move so I can get to the sink, please? Like, I just fucking got to move. And like, I, I smelled like bacon when it was all said and done. So, um, so, uh, yeah. So I'm going to wrap this up. <clears throat> I'm going to, um, you're, you're going to listen to some stuff here, but if you hang on and wait till the end, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, I have a thing here about, what is it? 
I have Catholic answers to the Inquisition. This is like the orthodoxy. Like, what do you say when you're, <laughs> what do you say when people start talking and asking uh, very difficult questions about the Inquisition? So I thought that would be fun to uh, close out the show with. So um, before we do that, I just want to tell everyone to check out stigmatastudios.com oh also i just bought abercast.com so if you go if you type in abercast.com it'll take you to stigmatastudios.com you can check out all the cool stuff on the website it's still kind of a work in progress but all the links work now well most of them uh most of the links work now um so but there's great stuff there there's fun stuff there uh thanks um to whatever also want to say if you like listening to podcasts on youtube if that's if that's better for you somehow <coughs> uh you could click the link to my youtube channel and now thanks to spreaker all the episodes that i publish through spreaker gets automatically uh packaged up as a youtube video so it's a great way to check out the show catch up on the show whatever's you know what i'm saying so um there rate and review the show on itunes please and please also remember there's patreon i'm trying to get uh some goodwill going to do like a books for soldiers program i'm already tied into two books for soldiers programs i'm just i just need a little bit of funding to get the um uh shit together and then we get you know we, uh, with a little bit of help, then you can give me a little bit more help and send me books, and then we can get them to we can get them to soldiers. So that's what I want, that's what I want to do. Um, so okay, listen to this, and then hang on tight uh, to the end if you want to get into these uh, uh, what, <laughs> Catholic answers to the, <laughs> to the modern Catholic answers to the Inquisition. <laughs> Stigmata Studios presents The Scorpion Strikes In this comic book A terrorist called The Scorpion Is transported to a secret CIA prison He quickly turns the tables on the guards and administrators And releases the prisoners A well-armed anarchist called Constituent Zero Assembles a team And fights to take the prison back the story is a dark political action thriller. The Scorpion's actions set the stage perfectly for the Jin Jihad. Available on Indie Planet. Get more info on The Scorpion Strikes, The Jin Jihad, and other titles at stigmatastudios.com. Stigmata Studios presents The Test of the Scorpion. In this comic book, while the Jin Jihad is raging on one side of the city, the terrorist called the Scorpion sets a secondary attack in motion as he obtains a small tactical nuclear bomb. A mysterious, ever-living warrior called Cyrus the Dead Guy steps forward to test the faith of the Scorpion and his lunatic followers. This is an action-adventure story it's a bit of swashbuckler that wraps up the Jihad stories. Available on Indie Planet. Get more info on the Scorpion Strikes, the Jin Jihad, the Test of the Scorpion, and other titles at StigmataStudios.com. <clears throat> All right. So Catholic Answers, the Inquisition, the Catholic www.catholic.com backslash tract backslash the hyphen inquisition sooner or later any discussion of apologetics with fundamentalists will address the inquisition to non-catholics it's a scandal to catholics an embarrassment to both a confusion it is a handy stick for the catholic bashing simply because catholics seem at a loss for a sensible reply this tract will set the record straight <laughs> There have actually been several different inquisitions. The first inquisition was established in 1184 in southern France. And they're playing fast and loose with these dates here, as uh, we talked about earlier. 
Response to the Catharist heresy. This was known as the Medieval Inquisition, and it was phased out as the, Cath- as the Cathar- Catharism disappeared. Quite separate was the Roman Inquisition, which began in 1542, and it was at least active to most uh, of the benign of the three variations. Separate again was the infamous Spanish Inquisition, which nobody expected. It started in 1478. A state institution used to identify conversos, which are the... I don't know if I should read this, because this is going to be an an episode coming up. Okay, anyhow. Conversos, which were Jews and more... This is actually wrong as well. Uh, Conversos were Jews. The Muslims had a different name. Uh, The converted Muslims had a different name. So this whole thing is just falling apart already. Uh, pretended to convert to Christianity for purpose. It wasn't, it's not even a pretending to convert to Christianity is when you talk about Jews and Muslims, you're talking about more than a religious, uh, a religious, you're talking about a, a, a component, a racial component or a cultural component that has their own traditions and social mores with them. So, like it would be just the same thing. I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, so you can't, you, you can't just make a Jew convert and then like have them not speak Hebrew or write things in Hebrew or do things in he Hebrew or you can't just say a Muslim convert is now c- Catholic and then just have them like when he prays he still tilts his shit to Mecca like. I guess that might be heretical, but there's a there's a cultural traditional component to all to this. So when he says he pretended to convert to Christianity, I think that there's a problem. I think there's a problem with that. And we'll get to it. Like I said, this is going to be a whole episode eventually, maybe even next week. I don't fucking know because I'm kind of fired up about it right now. For purposes of political or social advantage and secretly practice their former religion. Most importantly, it's the job. Uh, its job was also to clear the good. It was the job was to clear the good names of the people who were falsely accused of being heretics. And it was the Spanish Inquisition that at at least in the popular imagination, had the worst record of fulfilling these duties. All right, I'm going to skip the rest of the Spanish Inquisition nonsense. The, this fucking this guy's got me wound. This, this has already got me wound up. Fundamentalist, I'm not even going to read this shit either. Don't fear the facts, it says. But the facts fail to do that. The church has nothing to fear from the truth. No account of foolishness, misguided zeal, or cruelty by Catholics can undo the divine foundation of the church. Although admittedly these things are stumbling blocks to Catholics and non-Catholics alike, what must be... (laughs) These people need editors. This is all fucked up. What must be... I'm just going to correct it without saying what's for you. What must be grasped is that the church contains within itself all sorts of sinners and names, and some of them obtain positions of responsibility. Paul and Christ himself warned us that these would be a few ravenous wolves among church leaders in Acts 20, 29 and Matthew seven fifteen. Fundamentalists suffer from the mistaken notion that the church includes only the elect for them. Sinners are outside the doors locate sinners and you locate another place where the church is not thinking that fundamentalists might have a point in their attacks on the inquisition catholics tend to be defensive i mean if you have the pope saying i mean, I don't know how it cannot be the Pope's fault. I don't know how it cannot be Catholicism's fault. This is the wrong attitude. Rather, we should learn what really happened and understand the events and lights of these times and explain the anti-Catholics why the sorry tale does not prove what they think it proves. Uh, I'm just looking through this. I'm not going to read this whole thing. And really, my blood pressure is just fucking going crazy right now. Marriage was scorned because it legitimized sexual relations with Cathars 
uh, which Cathars identified as original sin. That is not true. That is just not true. Fornication was permitted because it was temporary secret and was not generally approved of, while marriage was permanent, open, and publicly sanctioned. None of that whole paragraph is true. I can't even, I'm not even going to get into this. You got your hour. I done my hour. I I'm, I got to get out of here. Um, I'm going to make Sloppy Joe grilled cheese for my wife because she's not feeling good. And that's, I mean, it, it, at least it's comfort food for me. <laughs> I'm John. This has been the Ambercast um, episode on the Medieval Inquisition. And thank you guys. Remember, sports show as best as you can, whenever you can. That's all I could do when I could do it. This is Soda Jerk. Fuck fight. Well, I was just 14 when I had my pussy in my darling whiskey. She tied up her grip.